being told that I was fired from my job because I allowed the second half of that question to come in. <laughs> okay, uh, now I'm delighted to introduce the House Ways and Means Committee's ranking member, uh, Mr. Dave Camp. Uh, Congressman Camp's career in public service spans nearly 30 years. <clears throat> he was first elected to represent Michigan's 4th District in 1990. Throughout his tenure, uh, the Congress has been a strong supporter of expanding trade through bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. He has also played a leading role in working across the aisle to expand the trade, assist trade adjustment assistance to cover service workers uh, in 2009. As a key figure in the Republican Party with a strong record of leadership on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Congressman Camp was chosen to serve as a ranking member in December of 2008. Prior to his election in the House, he served as a special assistant to the Attorney General and then the Attorney General of the State of Michigan, Chief of Staff for a member of Congress, then as a member of the Michigan House of Representatives. So it's interesting that he was a staff person and then now he's serving as a member of Congress. Uh, he owns a BA from Albion, I think that's how you pronounce it, college. It's close, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, and also a JD degree from the University of San Diego Law School. Uh, it's interesting that uh, he is known for keeping a close connection uh, to his uh, constituents. In fact, uh, it is said that he sends personally some 30,000 pieces of mail that go out to his constituents every year. And in June of this year, The Hill named him one of the 25 hardest working lawmakers. And actually, when I read that, I, and I thought of Michigan and Motown and I thought of the Godfather, James Brown, and I thought I would introduce you as the hardest working man in Congress. That is what they can. speakers you've heard today I thought I said I hope there's a strong round of coffee uh, before I get up there so you've been very good to have everybody come here today and uh, thank you for letting me be here um, you know I, I also want to thank the Coalition of Service Industries for having me here today I sure appreciate that um, it's really an honor to be here uh, as as George said I was born and raised in Michigan and it's where my wife and I are raising our three children and obviously Michigan is the industrial Midwest, the home of auto manufacturing and workers and unions. And Did I wake you up yet? <laughs> but there is more to Michigan. And as you well know, more to manufacturing and more to the production of goods. Manufacturing may get the most attention, but it cannot exist without the service industry. From the transportation of materials to the plant and the final product to the showroom floor to the information technology and research and development to the financial, professional, and business services you provide. The service industry is not only the backbone and central nervous system of U.S. manufacturing and agriculture, but also of our entire economy. It may surprise some of you that someone from Michigan is so partial to the service sector, but my first job and paycheck, and unfortunately my first experience with the withholding of taxes was working for my father in his own small business and his auto dealership. Now that was just a small family business in Midland, Michigan, but then small businesses can become big businesses. Just look at this little messenger company founded in 1907. Today UPS is a multi-billion dollar global enterprise. And along with other CSI companies from FedEx to AT&T to Verizon, your businesses combine to account for nearly 80% of private sector GDP. And not surprisingly, you employ eight out of every 10 workers in the private sector in this country. Now, in my district, it's only about 7.5 out of every 10 workers, but that's still a pretty impressive feat. The service sector is not only the core of our domestic economy, but at least 70% of worldwide GDP, it is the core of the global economy as well. And that's what I really want to focus on today, the state of the U.S. and the international marketplace. Not since the 1930s has so much uncertainty gripped investors, employers, families. The unemployment rate here in the U.S. has been stuck at above 9% for the last 16 consecutive months. And while Greece teetered on the brink of bankruptcy, 
the U.S. debt was driven to historic and dangerous levels. All the while, Congress and the President enacted nearly $700 billion in new taxes, with a $3.8 trillion tax hike still looming on the horizon. <coughs> Add to that the upcoming election. An election is hotly contested and as intense as any I've seen since I've been in politics. It's clear America is at a crossroads, trying to determine its future and regain control of our economic fate. The success of that effort has much to do with the success of your companies and our ability to create an environment for growth as it does with anything else. So while I'm well aware of President Reagan's quip that the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help, let me nonetheless assure you that I am here to help. And let me assure President Obama that regardless of the election outcome, I am committed to helping him meet the goal of doubling U.S. exports by 2014. And as you know, services will play a vital role in, the, in meeting that goal. Already the United States is the leading services exporting country with exports of $502 billion in 2009 and a trade surplus of $132 billion. I agree with and support the Export Promotion Cabinet's conclusion in its recently released report to the President on the National Export Initiative that, and I quote, international trade in services is critically important to continued economic expansion, end quote. But doubling exports will not be easy. Today, instead of capitalizing on trade opportunities to turn the sluggish American and global economy around, too many are capitalizing on a weak economy to spread fear about trade agreements and international commerce in hopes of turning around their political careers. While the admitted goal of boosting their prospects at the polls, while the admitted goal of boosting their prospects at the, at the polls this November, congressional Democrats are threatening to take action on China currency. That is emotional, ineffectual, and, and probably now, who knows with this new version, which no one has seen, uh, may be what WTO and consistent. Without addressing the larger issues and other issues that are facing our relationship with China, such as the blatant disregard of intellectual property rights and others. On top of that, nearly one third of the House has signed on to a, a, a dangerous piece of legislation, I think, that would not only reopen our current trade agreements, but place a moratorium on pending and future agreements. The political environment we face is not exactly conducive to putting American companies and their employees on the top. The rest of the world, however, is, is not simply sitting idly by. The EU has an active and flourishing bilateral negotiating agenda and is presently negotiating trade agreements with a large number of countries, including China and India, all the while American employers and workers are falling further behind. Trade agreements are the most sure and cost-effective way to boost economic growth by creating new markets for U.S. goods and services. The last decade has seen exports of services to Mexico and Canada more than double, while our agreements with Chile and Singapore have driven up U.S. exports more than 60% each. Yet the Ways and Means Committee has not held a single hearing at the full committee level or the subcommittee level on even one of the pending trade agreements in well over a three-year period since they were signed. Not South Korea, not Colombia, not Panama. The action, the inaction is simply inexcusable, especially in light of nearly 10% unemployment in this country. In June, the President declared he wanted to finish the South Korea agreement before the end of the year. In less than six months, I welcome that announcement and am committed to helping any way that I can. I also call on the President to put the same emphasis on the languishing agreements with Colombia and Panama complete them both within six months for the sake of our workers, our goods, and our services. It's time for Doha to make its way back into the lexicon. It has been more than two years since talks broke down in Geneva and the ground remains stuck. More ambition is needed, particularly from emerging, developing countries. And overall, we must work with our key trading partners to reinvigorate negotiations and to improve market access offers. We're particularly far behind on services. However, <coughs> services.